Solving general chemistry problems. Electrochemistry. An electrochemical cell is formed using a zinc electrode in a zinc sulfate solution and a copper electrode in a copper sulfate solution. If the reactants are at standard conditions, what is the measured potential of the cell? Which metal is being reduced? How would we represent the cell using standard notation? If we correctly attach a voltmeter to the cell, we would measure 1.10 volts as the cell potential. We would also observe over time that the blue color in the copper electrode solution would become fainter, and we might notice a deposit of finely divided copper metal on the electrode. The copper was being reduced. In standard cell notation, this cell would appear as zinc solid, zinc 2 plus aqueous 1 molar, copper 2 plus aqueous 1 molar, copper solid. So to figure out where all this notation and observations come from, we will now look at how we can arrive at these conclusions. A redox reaction can be very exergonic. Now recall that exergonic means that it releases Gibbs energy, a portion of which is enthalpic and the rest is entropic. The split between the two is fixed by the state properties. Some of that energy will be released as heat and the rest will be available as work. The division between them depends upon the device we are using. The combustion of gasoline, its reaction with oxygen to produce CO2 and water, is exergonic. Remember that redox is short for reduction oxidation. The two processes must occur together. Something gives up electrons, is oxidized, to something that receives electrons, is reduced. The processes must be paired and balanced. In gasoline combustion, carbon is being oxidized and oxygen is being reduced. If you wanted mostly heat from this reaction, you could burn it in an open barrel. If you wanted more of the energy as work, you could burn it in an internal combustion engine and use it to drive your car. If you wanted to capture even more of the energy as work, you could set it up to work in an electrochemical cell. In this case, it would be called a fuel cell. Electrochemical cells are, by comparison, very efficient at devices that can take a substantial portion of the energy released by a redox reaction and convert it into electrical energy. That energy can then be used to drive a car, charge a cell phone, or light a light bulb. In the case of the combustion discussed above, only a few percent of the total energy would appear as work when it was burnt in an open barrel. Uh, the work that was needed was to push back the atmosphere to make space for the water vapor and CO2 that is produced. In the internal combustion engine, about 25% of the total energy shows up as work to drive the car. And in the case of the fuel cell, the fraction captured as work could be 50% or even 60% of the total enthalpy released. Electrochemical cells are tremendously important devices by which chemical energy is stored and converted into electrical energy. They are designed to manage a redox process. There is always a reduction and an oxidation working together. When we burn the hydrocarbon fuel, the carbon atoms give up their electrons directly to the oxygen atoms. Carbon is oxidized and oxygen is reduced. In an electrochemical cell, however, the fuel, with all of the carbon atoms, is kept isolated from the oxygen. The cell is designed to still allow the electrons to move from the fuel, the carbon atoms still give up their electrons, over to the oxygen, which is still receiving the electrons. The key feature here is that the electrons travel from the fuel side through an external circuit and then to the oxygen side. And while traveling through the external circuit, we can get that electric current to do work. We might use that current to charge a battery, run a car, or power a factory. Whatever we choose, we have converted the chemical energy contained in the bonds of the molecules participating in the redox reaction into another form of energy that we can use more effectively. Chemicals are a tremendous way of storing energy. Electrochem electrochemical cells are a tremendous way of getting access to that energy. Forcing the exchange of electrons in a redox reaction to occur externally is the key design element in an electrochemical cell. The energy from burning gasoline can be taken from the uncontrolled flame of the barrel and exchanged instead for the controlled current flow that can power any electrical device. Let's look a little more closely at the structure of an electrochemical cell. The most apparent aspect is that it is divided into two sections, one where the oxidation process occurs and the other where the reduction occurs. In the 19th century, Michael Faraday was developing the science and engineering of electrochemistry. He was searching around for what to name these two compartments. He was playing with several names, but he asked a friend at Cambridge, William Hewell, 
who suggested that he call them cathode and anode. Hewell was an English polymath, which means that he knew a lot about a lot of different things, and is now most famous for the new words he created. For instance, he created the words scientist and physicist. Before that, scientists were known as natural philosophers. For Michael Faraday, he also coined the words electrode and ion. The current convention is to name the electrode at which the reduction is occurring at the cathode. Oxidation, therefore, is occurring at the anode. This will always be the case. A mnemonic I use is to note that both cathode and reduction begin with consonants, while oxidation and anode both begin with vowels. But whatever works for you. In each compartment there is a particular substance that is changing oxidation state. In the anode, that substance is being oxidized. In the cathode, the other substance is being reduced. But note that in each compartment that substance is present both in its reduced and oxidized forms. Not commonly, but not exclusively by any means, one form of the substance is a piece of metal, while the other form is that of a dissolved ion in a solution. An example of such a cell is what we saw earlier involving zinc and copper. Both compartments have a piece of the respective metal, and then each compartment is also filled with an aqueous solution of the associated ion. Very often the solution is made up of a salt with a counter ion that allows the salt to dissolve completely. You will sometimes see nitrate, sulfate, or chloride salts, but many other possibilities can exist. We will run into other situations as well, where both forms are dissolved ions, or where both forms are solids and where one of the forms is a gas. Clearly, each kind of a cell would need to have a different engineering solution, but in general chemistry we can still study the chemistry without worrying too much about the engineering. One important aspect of an electrochemical cell is the maximum potential it can develop. We measure this by connecting a voltmeter between the two electrodes. An electrochemical cell that produces energy is called a voltaic or galvanic cell. They both mean the same type of cell. The difference is more historical. If you're trying to get a high voltage out of a cell, you might call it a voltaic cell. But if you're trying to get a large current out of it, you might call it a galvanic cell. But the chemistry is all the same. We will find people use the terms interchangeably. Now, and by the way, the names come from two Italian scientists, Volta and Galvani, who were pioneers in the development of electrochemistry. Now, the problem we have at this point is when we connect the voltmeter at the two electrodes, nothing happens. The voltmeter registers no potential. Now, the problem is that we do not have a complete electrical circuit. Oxidation may occur in the anode cell, adding zinc ions to the solution while producing excess electrons in the zinc metal. And reduction may be occurring in the cathode cell, which is removing copper ions from that solution and removing some electrons from the copper metal electrode in the process. But note the problem. Very quickly, in, in nanoseconds perhaps, an excess positive charge arises in the anode compartment because more zinc 2 plus is introduced, but the amount of sulfate remains the same and an excess of negative charge arise, arises in the cathode compartment. While copper 2 plus is being removed, the amount of sulfate again remains the same. Well, because of the reaction, electrons want to flow from the anode to the cathode, the cell quickly delivers a new potential that wants to pull the electrons back to the anode. It is positive now, and push them away from the cathode, it is negative. And so nothing happens. The challenge is to find a way to add in more negative ions to the anode compartment to balance the zinc ions being produced and, at the same time, introduce more positive ions to the cathode cell to balance the copper ions being removed. In essence, there needs to be a complete electrical circuit. A new circuit component needs to be added, and this component needs to allow ions to flow but not electrons. If this additional circuit element allowed electrons to flow, it would short-circuit the external path and we would have defeated the use of the cell. With two liquid compartments, like the model we are showing here, a device called a salt bridge can be used. This is just a tube that is filled with a gel that is filled with some non-reactive ions. The gel keeps the solutions in the compartments and the tube from mixing with each other directly. Yet the ions are still able to move around. It is common to make the gel up with a solution of sodium chloride or potassium chloride, but a solution of potassium nitrate works very well since the rate at which K plus ions move is about the same as the rate at which nitrate ions move. This makes for the best salt bridge. There are many other engineering solutions to this problem. 
You could fill the bridge with KNO3 solution and then put in a gel plug in each end, or you could replace the gel plug with a solid thin porous plug in each end. You could replace the whole tube with a sheet of paper that is soaked in KNO3. There are some cells which use a piece of plastic that allows ions to migrate through them, and some have a thin film of a solid ionic material that also can conduct. The specific nature of the salt bridge is an engineering solution. Once again, for general chemistry, we just recognize that we need some kind of a bridge to conduct ions. Without being more specific than that, we can continue to study the chemistry of the redox process. So with the salt bridge in place, the circuit is complete, and the voltmeter now reads the potential difference between the two cells. In this case, with zinc and copper electrodes and solutions with one molar concentration, the measured cell potential is a positive 1.10 volts. The most basic structure of an electrochemical cell is that it consists of two compartments, we will call them half cells, joined in some fashion to permit the migration of ions, but not electrons. Most commonly, we will complete this joining with a salt bridge of some unspecified design. So without drawing this rather complicated diagram, how can we convey this information for a given cell? A standard cell notation has been developed to do this. Write out the various reaction participants, include their phase, include concentrations or pressures or activities as appropriate. The anode, where oxidation occurs, is on the left, while the cathode is on the right. Write out the anode electrode, followed by the pertinent species that are in the solution. If there are several species in the solution, separate them with a comma. Separate different phases with a single vertical line. If a salt bridge is present, to separate the anode from the cathode, as it often will, write in a double vertical line. Write down the solution phase species in the cathode cell, followed by that electrode. Include again the solid vertical line between the phases. Here is a standard notation for the Danielle cell, which is the cell that we have been looking at. First, the solid zinc electrode, which is the anode. Then there is a phase boundary between the solid zinc and the solution, which is a zinc 2 plus aqueous solution of one molar concentration. This is followed by the salt bridge. We do not usually specify its nature. In general chemistry, we are not usually concerned with those details. It is followed by the cathode compartment solution, which is copper 2 plus with a concentration of one molar. We do not usually specify the counter ions, sulfate in this case, but they could be included if desired or necessary. There is then another phase boundary, and it is followed at last by the copper electrode, which is in the cathode compartment. Electrochemical cells are thoroughly described by this notation. Variations from what I've written here that you may encounter include a possible liquid electrode, multiple solid phases next to each other, multiple reactive ions in the same solution, and possibly even a cell without a salt bridge. But you should be able to study the chemistry of any cell written in this notation.